OK, uh, thank you very much, Tom, and good evening, everyone. So uh, those of you who are, who are familiar with the website of uh, the Monk project may have noticed that the project often highlights this same particular autograph manuscript, which is preserv preserved in the Ghent University Library. It is known as the Liber Floridus, compiled by Lambert of Saint-Omer in the early 12th century. Um, as we will see shortly, the manuscript has its origins in northern France, but it has been kept in the Ghent Abbey of St. Bavo since the 13th century. The manuscript is not only an absolute masterpiece within the collections that the Monk project is focusing on, but also, I think, from the perspective of European uh, book history. The Liber Floridus has been the subject of extensive research and uh, most attention until now has been given to the extraordinary maps and diagrams it contains, as well as the typical encyclopedic uh, characteristics of the book. Several historians have also explored how the Liber is infused with uh, salvation history and eschatology. And they convincingly argue that Lambert must have been particularly impressed by the conquest of England, the success of the First Crusade, and the fortunes of the Flemish Comital dynasty. Given the large number of publications that already exist on the Liber Floridus, one might even ask if much more can still be added to this uh, scholarship. Well, uh, certainly, uh, because the manuscript is now digitally available through uh, IIIF. And uh, please, um, also note that the Ghent University, uh, the Ghent University Library um, provides the complete diplomatic edition as well uh, by Albert Durolé in digital format. So if you happen to have multiple computer screens, you can of course view the digitized manuscript during our presentation. The digital if availability of the manuscript has allowed Wim and me to arrive at a new understanding of Lambert's autograph composition, and our findings are detailed in a quite lengthy uh, article published in the journal Sacris Euridiri just uh, before the summer. And today we are pleased uh, to share our main uh, hypothesis and uh, insights with you. Now, in uh, 2011, a beautiful exhibition on the Liber Floridus took place in the Ghent City Museum, and the exhibition was titled The World in a Book. This famous fold-out mini miniature that, that you can see now uh, of the globe beautifully um, illustrates how Lambert, how for Lambert uh, the book, uh, his flower book, was, was more than a neutral carrier of the information that he wanted to compile. The materiality of his book and its content blend together, so to speak. And on this double full page miniature, I think this is very visible. Today, we would like to extend that idea further. And it is our hypothesis that Lambert's book also coincides in a particular way with Saint-Omer, the city of Saint Audomarus, where Lambert lived and worked. The city in his book forms, as the title of our presentation suggests, uh, a kind of a circular enclosure of creation, history, and incarnation. Yet before we start our actual presentation, we would like to provide some facts and figures related to the manuscript. It is important to know, I think, that Lambert, a secular canon associated um, to the chapter of Our Lady in Saint-Omer, must have written this autograph between approximately um, 1100 and 11 and 1121. And we can derive this from the earliest and most recent datable facts described in it. Now, fundamental to all further research on the autograph is the lifelong dedication of Albert Durolé to what he calls the stratigraphy of the choirs um, and of the Codex. Thanks to Derolet's brilliant research, we now have a great understanding of the structure of the manuscript. Derolet managed to show how we can distinguish at least some 13 more or less datable phases in the growth of the autograph. And these phases implied a continuous reshuffling of choirs and folios. And it actually also resulted in some inconsistencies in the folio numbers, in lost choirs, and so on. 
that most of the lost choirs and lost information can be reconstructed thanks to early copies of the manuscripts. As um, Hannah Vorhol's research has uh, revealed, there are still about 20 partially or fully preserved, preserved copies of the Liber Floridus uh, today, uh, dating from the 12th to the 16th centuries. Today, the Liber Floridus, and especially the autograph, is uh, primarily seen as a, brilliant, as a, a brilliantly illustrated encyclopedia, a collection of knowledge that Lambert has managed to acquire, but we believe that we can reconsider that uh, specific qualification. But so let's finally begin with uh, the, the actual uh, presentation of our um, research. At the beginning of the 12th century, Saint-Omer was one of the most dynamic centers of early urbanization in the county of Flanders. But the Liber Floridus is not at all known as a work that tells us much about the historical significance of Lambert's hometown. Actually, like most uh, ecclesiastical authors of his time, Lambert appears to have had little interest in the social reality of the growing city and of the lay activities that took place in it. It is therefore often assumed that the influence of his urban environment on his compilations must have been very limited. And indeed, the Liber Floridus is commonly considered as a work that stands outside and even above ordinary time and everyday history. So a work that is rather detached from local situatedness. In our presentation, we nevertheless want to examine precisely the significance of the city in the Liber Floridus. And to this end, we will descend from the historical and material reality of Saint-Omer into the text of the Liber. In doing so, we, we raise the question as to what extent both the city as a general concept and more specifically the town of Saint-Omer are present in Lambert's work. We believe that even more than in the content of his Liber, Liber um, the key to answering this question can be found in its specific structure. Albert de Rollet's magnificent codicological analysis have allowed him to recognize an, a kind of an associative structure underlying Lambert's book project. And this means that each, each uh, chapter appears to evoke the next one through certain mental um, associations, which results in chains of chapters dealing with more or less similar or related topics. Such linear compositions are indeed quite common in book production around 1100. Now, this insight may help us to understand why specific texts succeed each other, but it does not clarify how the chains themselves are organized and if there exists a larger compositional framework encompassing the entire work. It should be noted that the period in which, in which Lambert worked also started to show a particularly strong preference for the circular composition as a way of organizing texts and materials in manuscripts. It is exactly the fusion of both linear and circular logic into one meaningful structure that proves crucial, we think, for the composition of the Liber Floridus. And recognizing this will help us to understand Lambert's continuous moving around of choirs and the pains he took to add elements without changing the overall composition of his work. And more, re more remarkably, um, it will bring us to the middle of the town of Saint-Omer. Today, Saint-Omer is known as a small provincial town in the north of France, that's some 30 kilometers from the North Sea coast. But in the early 12th century, it was definitely one of the most vibrant centers of urban and commercial activity in the, the county of Flanders. The origins of Saint-Omer date back to the mid 7th century when Bishop Audemar of Terouan founded a missionary post on the marshy banks of the River A at the place called Sitiou. For two centuries, the settlement continued to serve an essentially religious goal. And in the low lying um, area, several sanctuaries were built. The most important of these was the church, which kept the relics of Saint-Bertin, Audemars most important disciple. 
and this church would later develop into the famous Abbey of Saint Bertin, which is situated here. I don't know if you can see my mouse uh, here on the on the map. Now, um, on a sandy hill, less than a kilometer to the west, Audemar had also founded another church dedicated to Our Lady, which became the burial place of his, uh, of his own relics. And it was here that the chapter of Our Lady was going to develop an institution for secular canons, of which Lambert, as we have seen, was a member. The morphology of the settlement of Saint-Omer, and then especially the area around the church of Our Lady, witnessed important additions as of the second half of that same 9th century, when the young dynasty of the Counts of Flanders started to expand its territorial power and to develop the site of Saint-Omer into an important basis of power. The area around the Church of Our Lady was fortified for the first time after the Viking raid of 979. And that is here, this area. The ramparts probably consisted of a simple semicircular ditched palisade fixed in raised earth around an area of two hectares at most. From this time, commercial activities began to identify to, ident uh, to intensify, I'm sorry, in the upper part of the city, ensuring the basis for real urban development. Then a second wall, dating from around, uh, from around the year 1000, expanded the enclosed urban area and fortified the neighborhood around the Vieux Marché, just north of the oldest fortification. That is here. And by this time, the Grand Marché here uh, had also come into use. Another few hundred meters further north, where already during the 11th century, a guild hall was built as well. However, after the, after the destruction of this second enclosure by the French king Philip I in 1071, the still expanding city needed a new fortification. And then around 1100, that is during Lambert's lifetime, a third city wall was built, which now not only enclosed the Grand Marché, but also covered the new area to the east up to a few hundred meters from the Abbey of Saint-Bertin. So this is here, this entire area. Around that time, it is estimated that some 4,000 inhabit inhabitants must have lived in this newly formed castrum. It is difficult to determine what these ramparts of around 1100 must have looked like and uh, have looked like. It seems unlikely that we can imagine such an enclosure from around 11 1100 already as an archetypical crenellated uh, town wall of stone uh, surrounding the entire city. Already during the 11th century, the inhabitants of Saint-Omer, and especially those who earned their living by trading, must have joined together in a local merchant guild under the patronage of Saint-Omer. And by an extraordinary coincidence, we still have the statutes of this guild, of which the surviving version must date from around 1100. These merchant customs give an exceptional insight into how trade and social bonding was organized. A striking feature in these statutes is the importance that the guild members attached to geographic, to a kind of geographic definition of their community and to the city walls. They stated that they were uniting all those who resided, and then uh, in, in Latin, in Villa Nostra, well in Suburbio, by which they meant both the enclosed part of the city and the neighborhoods just outside of it. Moreover, they uh, promised to use the surpluses of their joint investment in their drinking ceremonies for the maintenance of the streets, city gates and fortification. And Finally, what is fascinating about this document is that we learn from it how the local clergy, clergy thus probably including secular canons such as Lambert, also became involved in the lay rituals of these uh, drinking ceremonies. Now, the civil aspirations of the merchant guild provided the stepping stone to a new form of solidarity, a sworn association of citizens within a so-called commune, which could also be found at that time in several other towns in northern France. The oldest charter of this commune 
issued by the Count of Flanders and dating from 1127, shows once again the importance of enclosures and determining who belonged to the community and who did not, and thus who could enjoy the privileges uh, that were granted by the Count. For example, the exemption from poll tax and guardianship fees was reserved only for those who lived infra murum sancti audo mari, so within the wall of Saint Omer. Since he probably died around 1121, Lambert himself may not have witnessed this last crucial episode in the communal history of Saint Omer. Nonetheless, it is clear that in the decades preceding 1127, uh, he must have felt the drastic changes in the city, changes that were resulting in the gradual decline of the importance of Saint Omer as primarily a religious ecclesiastical center. Now, that Lambert of Saint Omer felt deeply attached to Saint, to, to Saint Audomar, uh, Saint Audomarus, and uh, the latter's resting place in Our Lady's Church is clear from, from the Liber Floridus. His connection with the county of Flanders is also one of the many threads running through his work. But the fact that he was also a resident a citizen of the fast transforming town of Saint Omer emerges much less explicitly from his book. Certainly, his hometown appears several times in his work under both the names Situ and Sanctus Audomarus. Lambert terms, terms situ both villa and oppidum, and when he uses Sanctus Audomarus to name the city, he systematically does so in combination with the term castrum, right, which contains a clear reference to the walled part of the town. But the number of times the city of Saint Omer appears explicitly in the Liber Floridus remains limited to some five instances. And one of these can be found on folio 102 recto, which contains a description of how the uh, atrium of Saint Omer, fortified with walls and towers, is said to have offered protection to the relics of a number of saints against Danish ra raids in the late 9th century. That is, at the time of the first city walls. Besides, the autograph also shows how a 13th century hand, presumably from the Abbey of Saint Bavo in Ghent, has reproduced this same description of Saint Omer's first fortification almost word for word on folio 240 recto, which until then had remained half blank. We still come back to this pecu uh, very peculiar repetition. Nevertheless, it is safe to state that the city as a general subject is particularly present in Lambert's work. As can be immediately deduced from the table of contents of the autograph, the Liber Floridus contains all kinds of lists of cities. What is striking about these lists is that Lambert's fascination does not seem at all connected to the rise of towns in his own time. His perspective is inspired by salvation history and his interest lies in cities from biblical times and antiquity. His sources also all date from well before the High Middle Ages. Nevertheless, his Liber Floridus is unambiguous in its focus on the significance of the city as a driving force in history and as an idealized mental representation. The importance of the city of the Kivitas, from a biblical historical perspective, becomes clear from the very first sentence of what must be considered the first actual page of the autograph manuscript on folio one verso. It says, Cain, son of Adam, was the first to found the first city, which he called Ephraim. That is what you can see here on the slide. So the importance of the town in profane history gets an equally important place at the very end of the manuscript, because the final edition on the last page concerns a calculation of history that starts from the foundation and destruction of Troy and leads to the birth of Christ. And remarkably, just before this final passage on Troy, Cain too reappears again a second time as the founder of the first city of Ephraim. 
The Liber Florius opens, in other words, with a sentence about the foundation of the first city by Adam's oldest son, the first murderer in the history of humankind, and ends with a short chrono chronological reasoning grounded in the destruction of Troy, the mythical mother city of Rome, and of so many other European monarchies. In both passages, the city, and that is clear, is seen through a negative lens. In the description of the historical cities throughout the Liber Floridus, the importance of city walls also appears very clearly. In its discussion of these walls, the Liber seems to display a kind of an overarching narrative of foundation and destruction. The first part of the Liber, part of the Liber Floridus especially emphasizes the building of city walls as protection or as symbols of power. Babylon is mentioned at least four times for its impressive walls. Lambert also highlights walls in England and the reconstruction of the walls of Jerusalem by Nehemias. In the second part of his Liber, a number of city walls are still being erected, but most of the urban ramparts described from this point in the text have been destroyed, either by earthquakes or war. Last but not least, the various famous depictions of idealized cities in the Liber Floridus also show that for Lambert, the essence of an ideal city largely coincided with its walls, with its walls. And what this, um, uh, and, uh, sorry, what his um, miniatures of paradise, of heavenly and earthly Jerusalem and of Rome have in common, and you see them all here, is that they represent these places as perfectly circular walled cities. At first glance, the town of saint Omer itself does not seem to have received such pictorial honor in the Liber, for it is nowhere depicted, depicted in the same way in its entirety. Yet an analysis of the circularity in the construction of the autograph as a whole may prove otherwise. The importance of the circle in the imagery of the Liber combined with the appearance of the city, Kain's city and Troy, remember, both at the opening and in the conclusion, seems to suggest that the Liber in itself might answer to some form of circular composition. The most visible indication for the circle composition that moreover has great implication for our understanding of the entire Liber is the position attributed to the patron saint of Saint Omer, Saint Audomarus. His portrait appears twice, being both the first and the last miniature in the autograph. On folio 6 verso, here, Saint Audomar occupies a half page miniature. The saint is presented, seated on a half circle, prob half circle probably representing him sitting on the firmament. In his left hand, he holds the bishop's cross while his right hand is raised in benediction. The other portrait on folio 260 erecto covers the entire page, page and shows Saint Audemar standing once again in a pose of benediction and with a cross. Both portraits at each end of the Liber face each other and with their benediction they enclose the choirs in between. In front of each portrait, Lambert placed an image of the town of Saint Omer. So facing the half page miniature of the saint, we see towers and roofs above arcades. It is clear that this is an idealized image of the city walls with their crenellation. The identification with Saint Omer is guaranteed by the heading inscription, inscription stating, and that is what is written here, Sitio Villa it est Sancti Audomari Castrum. And below we see Lambert himself writing. He looks at the saint on the opposite page while he writes in the book in front of him. Facing the last full page miniature, Lambert painted the Church of Our Lady and of Saint uh, Audomarus with a shrine above the altar. But note that in reality, the Church of Our Lady was also situated close to the actual city walls of the town of Saint-Omer. So just 
as the portraits of the saint face each other and give their benediction to the liber between them, so the two images of the walls of Saint Omer delimit and protect that same big part of the liber that they enclose. The mirroring effect of both the saints' portraits and the city constructions invites us to recognize in the part of the liber that is enclosed by both pairs of images a parallel to the town of Saint Omer. The liber wants to be interpreted as the town of Saint Omer. This means it wants to be read as a circular, comp circular composition that is typical for the other towns depicted in the Liber Floridus, like Jerusalem or Rome. Saint Audemar and the walls and church of Saint Omer thus enclose the actual core of the book, not unlike how Cain's foundation of Ephraim encloses almost the entire Liber. Apparently, we must distinguish between two encirclements that are linked to the city. That which derives from its evil origins, the first city being founded by Cain, and that which falls under the protection of the patron saint Audomar, who appears and acts as the bulwark of the city walls. This representation also evokes a striking reminiscence of Isaiah 26, and which is, which is um, also here on the slide. We have a strong city. Salvation will got a point for walls and bulwark. This double encirclement invites us to have a closer look at what Lambert placed between Cain and Audomarus, that is, what is thus more or less placed outside the imagined city walls of the patron saint. Preceding the first full-page miniature of Audemar, we mainly find short notes on biblical history and several lists, as well as three dialogues between Christians and Jews, dealing with the fact that Judaism does not accept Christian salvation. Then, after the last full-page miniature of the saint, comes a historical section consisting largely of the history of the fall of Troy, followed by a Roman history until Pompey's death. So it is as if Lambert exiled the parts of Jewish and pagan history that led to Christian history, but are not part of it outside the walls of the city part of the Liber Floridus, and thus withdrew them from the protection of the saint. Lambert thus composed his book after the image of a walled city with a world inside and a world outside, the latter largely falling outside of Christian salvation history. This mindset did not fundamentally differ from that of the citizens of the real Saint Omer, who in their guild customs and in their communal uh, charters also distinguished between those who lived within their city walls and could therefore benefit from their privileges and, and from the protection of the city's uh, patron saint and those who did not. And here I give the floor to, to Wim to continue this talk. Okay, thank you, Jeroen. Um, we have, first of all have to apologize. As you can see that we are in two different rooms. So I'll have all, and uh, Jeroen is one who masters the, the slides. So I always have to interrupt my speech by saying that we're going to the next one. This was just uh, to, to warn you already for pronunciation for this uh, entire presentation. Okay, um, thank you for the for this uh, this introducing part and of the of introducing part for the first half of the of the uh, of the entire presentation, which is in these somehow half of our article. My um, duty now is to show you how it works, how actually we can come to read and look at the the manuscript in the way we are looking to it. And for that reason, we start with those four. Um, diagrams, as you can see, they are circular diagrams. They are the first diagrams that appear in the book. There's only the, the, the miniatures that you saw, the illuminations that you saw before, the, the illustration of um, St. Audemar, and the illustration of um, Situ and the, and the writing Lambert that proceed with one another short scheme about the Synoptic Gospels, but that's something different I'm not going to enter upon. So the first full page miniatures that you will encounter 
after entering the city, if you will may call it like this, now those four um, those four diagrams that you see here following each other very closely. They immediately they immediately draw attention to circular compositions, which is very important. They, they already show this idea of the circular um, way of looking at the world and looking at history. Um, because as we go, when we go to the next one, I will leave, uh, we'll take out two of those uh, diagrams, those two, um, and perhaps immediately the following also, because just to show you what it what it goes in goes on. So the first one to your left is actually it's uh, talking about the rains of the the different rains that have the seven in the seven uh, eras of the world that have rained over the world. The right one is talking about the eras of the world. Now, when you look very close, actually, the, I, I enlarge the centers of both. Um, the, to the left one, you see actually written the etates mundi. So those are the eras of the world. In the center of the reigns are the eras of the world. Now, the other one to the left is talking about the eras of the world. So it is as if the, those, uh, this image, this diagram of the to the to the right is actually enclosed or has to be in, has to be seen has to be read as being in the center of the other one of the left one. And there is a kind of um, a mise en abîme that you feel here that going into the to looking at the left um, image you are going to the center you see the etatus mundi and on the next verso because there are two versos following upon each other you see this etatus mundo with in the center this face of the mundus. And when you look very well in the center of it, you find a small hole because um, um, Lambert actually always drew all his circles with a compass, with a pair of compasses. And actually, so you have all, almost always you have this hole in the middle um, in which that, that shows actually that he was using those, um, the, this instrument, which is very important because in the, in the end of the 11th century, this, be, this gets a very, already a very strong um, cosmological significance, especially to the, and that will develop only further in the, uh, during the 12th century. Um, now, why, why do I show this? Because of course, as soon as you need, as you have a circle, you need a center, you need the core. You need a core from where you have to put your, one of the legs of the compass you have to put there, but even more, you have the center around which the entire uh, circle is concentrated. Now, Lambert in his book gives some more indications, especially in the beginning, at least as we take the book in a linear way from front cover to back cover, um, he gives some more indications about the importance he gives to the center. Indeed, the next one is a small fragment from the last, actually the last dialogue um, that is outside the walls in the first part, uh, the dialogue between the Jew Malchus and the priest Jesus. It is probably a text that was written by um, Lambert himself. And that's one of the, uh, one of the um, uh, thoughts that actually was proposed by uh, Albert Dorole, and I think you can, we can be sure about it. You, we, can't, we don't know another version of this text. It's actually a very scholastic discussion in which Malthus asks a question and Jesus gives an answer. And it's very short. But there are some places in which the dialogue becomes a little bit more live, lively. And that you see, this is one of those. It is a little bit a strange uh, dialogue because it's the, where is hell situated. Um, in, the, in the middle of the earth, in the, in the center of the, the world, actually, and Jesus answered, it is in earth and in heaven. And you can read it yourself. It is actually a very strange way of placing it, which in, with a very ironical and almost comical way of uh, treating a, a serious topic. Um, heaven of uh, hell is in the middle of the universe, so it is also in the middle of heaven. Actually, it is in heaven. But then the answer of Malchus, of course, in the end is very beautiful. Actually, you can defend it that way, but it remains far away from the kingdom of God. And that's one of those beautiful, you, you see that Lambert is actually playing also a little bit. He's playing with two elements. He's playing with the center. You have a center in the circular, in the circular composition of the universe. But there is also something of distance. Center does not mean that it is close. That's very important to see. But here, this is one of those small fragments that really indicates that a center has to be looked for. And that's actually what we're going to do now. We have a, have a look at the center of the Liber. Um, in, um, 
in a small note, which we didn't uh, reproduce, actually at the end of the, uh, the book, and small note that was added later, it's not from by Lambert himself, um, there is given the total number of choirs to have been 41, because as we said, uh, there have been lost uh, several, three ones, I, three choirs, I think. Um, but the original number must have been 41, and there is no reason to doubt this number. Um, that means that when we reconstruct the entire original liver floor, you know, the entire plan, that means that the actual choir 19, that the, the number 19 is 13th century, but that doesn't my, matter for the moment, that that actually originally was the central choir. That was the choir around, actually, uh, around which the entire book was organized. If you look at it, as you see it here, you see that the choir leads up to the Anselm of Canterbury, the Cur Deus Homo. Cur Deus Homo, um, that continues then and, and, on the, the, and, takes and, and takes actually the entire choir 20. Um, Lambert, however, did not copy Anselm's actual treatise. It is, we know the, 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 the treatise, of course. The treatise was finished in uh, 1098. Um, but what Lambert inserted in the Liber has become known as the Flores Libri Anselmi. So there are only two other copies known, and both seem to depend on this, um, on this, this copy of, um, of, the, of Lambert. And once again, the assumption is that Lambert must be considered the author of this text. So somehow a reworking of the, of the Cur Deus Homo by Anselm. Um, now, we will see that this is actually the center of the, 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 entire, of the entire manuscript. The entire manuscript is constructed to around this uh, text, as we can see in the following, normally, uh, the following, yes, there you see. Um, you see actually that uh, there are a lot of, let's say, echoes from the first and the second, between the first and the second part of the, with the, the Cur Deus Homo as a kind of the core on, on around which everything turns around. You see immediately, and that's very important that for this reason, this scheme is very important. Uh, you see immediately that it doesn't, doesn't fit everywhere. It is not symmetrical. I don't think Lambert wanted to make it exactly symmetrical, first of all, but the, the other part is also you can see how, that he had a lot of difficulties in keeping up the structure. You see that actually in the beginning, it seems very regular. And you see in the second part, you see how it somehow answers this regularity, but there are elements that disturb the symmetry. Are they conscious disturb disturbings? Uh, it could be, it could very well be. Uh, we, not very, we are not very, uh, that, has to, that needs a more, more study, actually, we, we, should, we, we should say. Um, now, let's continue to show a little bit what makes up this idea of circularity. Here you see the manuscript with all these kind of uh, elements, but we'll go to the, to the following, which is much, much more clear to show what happens. Here you see actually the different ways that we will, over, we will over, overgo them, every, um, all those uh, different uh, echoes, um, and then see what makes this symmetry, what makes this symmetry in the entire um, in the entire manuscript. And we will see in the end also why it was done. What does this mean that Lambert actually is working in this symmetrical way in order to receive this circular way of looking at the manuscript? What, <coughs> what does this mean? Um, okay, let's start, but we'll go, we'll not stop with all of those um, things just for, for time, but at some places I will, will stay a little bit to show a little bit more of it. Here you see, of course, the one we saw already. Um, we saw, here you see the two uh, opening and the two closing miniatures. And just to mention also, when um, uh, Lambert is writing, what Lambert is writing there on his, uh, in his manuscript is actually what is to be seen in the uh, manuscript in the Church of St. Odomar. He is, he is writing that in the year, I think, 1157, I'm not sure about the, the date, um, that, that, that the, the abbot Vido, as he says, um, exposed the relics of St. Odomar, that means on the, altar, on the altar, and that's actually on the altar, and that's what you see in the manuscript, uh, in the for the last manuscript, where you see the relics of St. Odomar on the altar, exposed as, as Lambert writes in his book. And you have to read it, you have to take this into account, because Lambert is writing in his book, not for himself, he's not writing actually the text, um, how we say that, that the text is uh, focused upon himself, so it's not written for us in a 
in, a, in the wrong way. No, he's writing it for us. You can read it just written in exactly the same way as all the other texts. It is for us to read this. So we have to make this link between this image and the for the last image, which is very important because this is one of those other hints that Lamut really wants to see us this book, his book, as a circular composition. Let's go to, to, to the following, to the next one. Um, here we see an, an important one also. It's actually the um, uh, Leviathan. Uh, the Leviathan with the, the Antichrist, you see them on the, the left. Um, Leviathan, uh, Antichrist sitting on Leviathan, which makes part of the bestiary. And I must confess that some of my students found a beautiful interpretation of what, how the animals in the bestiary are composed and what is their importance. And also for this, um, this uh, Leviathan, but I'm not entering upon this, I'm sorry, but I will give honor to my students. They really gave a very good interpretation of what is happening in the part of the bestiary of uh, the Liberfloides. Uh, but the Antichrist is, of course, the antipode of Christ. And indeed, those two images, they respond rather well to each other, also in the position of the manuscript. In the other manuscript, right, you see the Christ between church and synagogue, and actually uh, he is sending synagogue to a monster that looks like the, that looks like the Leviathan with open mouth. So there you see a little bit this um, echoing way of how um, Lambert once again wants us to take the manuscript as an entirety, as a total, you know, as a total uh, piece of art, we would say. Important here is also, that's why um, we gave the both um, the entire pages, the, ent the entire view, is that both images are once again facing each other. Just like the two um, images of St. Odomar, here you see Antichrist and Christ facing each other. And the, um, the Antichrist is on the verso, the Christ is on the recto. So actually, they enclose once again what is in between. Let's go continue, I'm looking at the time also. Another, another very particular and very remarkable element that he cut up, actually, in this case, are the poets of his colleague, Peter, Peter the Painter. Peter the Painter, in, uh, in the Liber Flores, we don't have many poems. So it is very, very remarkable that, in, that he gave a lot of space to the poems of Peter the Painter, and they are the, the oldest uh, testimony of this, in this poetry. But what is very particular is that the part that originally opened the, the, the entire sequel is, you see here, to the right. Because you see in the title, you see Peter presented, who he is. Whereas on the left, and that's the part that is in the first half, um, the name of Peter is only to be found in the margin. So it was, just, it was added afterwards. So probably the, 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 the right part was written first and was actually meant to open the entire, um, the entire sequel of poems. But then, for some reason or the other, Lambert cut the part, two parts in two and put the first part last in the second, for us, the second half of the manuscript, which could imply that actually you, you should not take the manuscript in a linear way from front cover to back cover. You can also go from back cover to front cover. It's one of those elements. And of course, this has to do with the secularity of the town. You can enter the town from two sides. That's actually what, he, what, what you could almost uh, suggest that he that he's of the, could almost conclude that he's suggesting. Let's go to the following. This is, we already saw. Actually, here you have the, the beautiful globe that answers once again in a rather perfect way the, the map of Europe at the other side. I don't have to, uh, we don't have to stop with it very much. That's actually just a kind of uh, one of those echoes that, you, that there is. This is also one that we already saw in the 13th century copy of the text that, we've, that we can find in the, in the, that we can find by Lambert himself. The only change that actually the 13th century the writer made was actually pushing a little, putting a little bit more his saint, his patron saint, Saint Bevo, to the front in the list of saints. But important for us is, and this is very important, that, that a monk of Saint Bevo in the 13th century still was sensible, sensitive and was sensible for this circular composition. The circular composition that he actually, he, because the, his copy really answers in a perfect way once again to the symmetry of the book. So he really felt this, and that's why he added exactly this text there, even when, when it was to push, to push a little bit his own saint. 
but that's um, actually this this feeling of what is happening in the manuscript is something very important. We will we'll turn to this in the conclusion. Okay. Um, the next one is there are two texts by Pseudo Methodius, both on the Antichrist. Um, they once again they answer each other perfectly. I don't need to to uh, to say a lot about this. The only thing is that we, what we know is that the second text, the, the text to the right, was written by Adson, um, a name rather known, actually, rather known. But, and so it is the question, did Lambert really not know that this was by Adson, or did he consciously make it a text of a pseudo methodius in order, in order to answer his composition? That is, of course, one of the things that we have to leave open, and I'm not going to answer this. But you see here once again that he, anyway, he had two texts, two texts by pseudo methodius, and he puts them on two places that really echo each other. Okay. The next one is also very beautiful. Perhaps the next one also, then we can see Charles de Balt a little bit um, greater um, for the next. Yes, there he is. Um, we have at, almost at the center, we have Augustus, as you can see, to, to the left in a half page min miniature, sitting also on the, on, the, on, the, on the throne, actually, with the world in his hand. Um, we see at the other side, uh, we see Charles de Balt. Uh, in a completely different context when you looked at the content, but it's very important that Charles de Bald is called here King of the Franks and Augustus, or Emperor, of the Romans. And in that sense, of course, he answers Octavianus Augustus in the same way as we saw already with the Antichrist and with the, the Christ. Um, and once again, here too, you see that they are facing each other. The one to the, on the first one, the other on the right. On the on the recto, so you see actually that there is a kind of of looking towards each others, which here and once again, and here also I have to 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 stress, it's not it was not Lambert's probably it was not his aim to make everything fitting to make a very strict and and uh, rude uh, symmetry. No, because um, um, Augustus also answers to St. Peter, St. Peter in Rome. Of course, you have several echoes that, that, that work onto each other. Okay, let's continue because the time is coming. We're coming to, to the center. Uh, just before the center, just before Anselm's, Anselm's treatise, uh, um, we have two texts. Before, we have a text from Josephus on Moses. And after, after, uh, immediately after the Codeo Soro, we have a lot of texts on Alexander. Why those two texts? Now, Alexander, he doesn't need any, any explanation as the conqueror of the world. Moses is not presented here as the leader of the, the Jewish people out into the desert. No, he is presented as the commander of the Egyptian army in the conquest of Ethiopia. So Moses is presented as a conqueror, just as Alexander is presented as a conqueror. And there, once again, you see this I, here, it's not in the images, it's more in the content. It's more in the ID that is presented. And that leads all up to the central, of course, and the core and center of the Duo Floridas. And that's the final one. It is the Flores Anselmi, Libri Anselmi, uh, Cur Deus Homo. Um, this is a very particular text. It must be said. Um, it is the only text in the entire Liber Floridus that has the, in its title the word Flores. Now, in the prologue, in the prologue, Lambert himself says actually that he's, ta he's taking the flowers of different, um, of different writers and puts them together. He weaves them together. It's an old image, and that's why he calls his, his book, the entire work, the Liber Floridus. That, but the only text that really is called after the flowers is this text of Anselm. So this text refers really to the, to the entire project, and which shows actually that we can't disconnect the Liber Floridus as, an, as a work from this central text, the Floris Libri Anselmi, which is a particular reworking. It has to be said because the, the, the reworking by Anselm is, has changed strongly the original text. The original text is a dialogue um, in this text is really is a treatise. It's a treatise answering questions. It is the only dialogues that we have in the Liber Floridus are outside the walls, at the dialogues between Jews and Christians. They do not belong, according to, um, to Lambert, apparently, inside the walls. Okay, let's just 
conclude, because we must leave some time for, for, for questions also, what does this all mean? First of all, I think what we have to realize is that manuscript culture that Lambert is confronting us with is really different. It is other. A manuscript is not a book, even when it looks the same. And of course, there are manuscripts that function as a book, but Lambert shows us very clear that for him, a manuscript does not function as we think a book should function. This is very important. I think we have to, the, the manuscript learns us, and this is very important in approaching manuscripts. The second point is that in the Liber Floridus, having the Curdeus Romo as its center, that means that incarnation is the central idea of the entire manuscript. Now, what does this mean? As we saw, the entire book is composed somehow as a sub, with a substructure, as a hypo image, we could say, uh, of the, the city of Saint Omer. Then it means that actually the Liber Floridus shows somehow how the city of Saint Omer incorporates itself, incarnates itself, in the book. Just as the entire history contained in the book, the history, the world history, the salvation history, is incarnated in the city of Saint Omer. This is, I th we think, this is more or less the image that the Liber Floridus wants to uh, participate, wants to uh, convey to us. Now, this uh, another thing is, of course, that the circle, looking at the manuscript from a circular composition, I think, is much more fruitful than looking to it uh, in its linearity as it has been done up up to now. Um, it also it changes everything and it changes the entire fame of Lambert as a kind of amateur and a, and a very bad collector and a very bad bad uh, compilator. In the in, in the end, actually, he is just he is much more than this. And I see I'm really in the end now, so I'm stopping it. I think it's um, we are also, we are also there. I think that um, the, what we tried to show is um, that Lambert in his book wanted to catch what happens around him in a more spiritual image, in a spiritual image that incarnates in the book. And I think let's stop there, because otherwise we have, don't have any questions anymore.